All right, everybody, thank you very much for joining us. My name is Doug Mark. I am the president of Learning Zen. Uh, for those of you that don't know Learning Zen, we're a, a learning management system geared towards the franchising community. So we've got about a little over 100 brands that we support inside of this industry. So we are you know, one of the tools that you'll be considering as you go down the avenue, maybe reviewing thousands of tools and what is best for you. And depending on which supplier you've spoken to, their product is probably the best. Um, but I've got a panel of experts up here today that are going to talk about some of the things that they learned along the way as far as tools that were great when they got started versus tools that are great today as they become established. And then eventually we'll talk a little bit about some of the tools that might have helped them through the COVID situation as well because those things definitely evolved. Um, before we go too far, just want to let everybody know the format has changed a little bit. So instead of talking up here for you know, roughly an hour and a half, uh, we're going to talk for about 35 minutes, and then we're going to break into some, some smaller group roundtables. So you're going to be able to get some industry expertise from other people in the franchising space that probably have hundreds of years of expertise, not just mine. Um, but what we're going to start off with is I'll introduce everybody, um, their names, their title, their company that they're with, and then they're going to tell you how they got started. I think the, one of the key things we think about when we go to Springboard is that a lot of people are here because they are emerging brands, and it's really nice to hear the story that helped these groups kind of get through those emerging stages and get to established stages. Um, and then hopefully we'll have time for some questions along the way as well at the end. Uh, so with no further ado, I'm going to start off with the first gentleman to my left. This is Josh Cohen. He is the CEO and founder of Junk Luggers. And uh, Josh, if you could just tell us your story and how you got started. All right. Uh, hello. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Um, so I started Junk Luggers about 18 years ago when I was in college. Um, a friend said he made $100 hauling away his neighbor's refrigerator. And I thought, I'm going home to make $10 an hour at my internship. So that's great. And so I went door to door with some homemade flyers and said, 21 year old college student wants to help you haul away your junk and donate and recycle whatever we can. You know, and that's been our big differentiator. And we've, we've really grown from there. I was using my mom's SUV. Um, and, uh, and so I, I grew privately for about nine years. Um, and then we started franchising in 2013. Uh, Anyone who's about to start franchising, Godspeed. <laughs> um, because it was really, really hard. But I think today we're going to talk about some things that might make it a little bit easier. Hopefully some things that you can learn from us so it won't be. Um, as of today, we have about 90 franchisees up and uh, we've awarded about 340 territories. I'll tell one quick funny thing about Josh as well is that he actually has twin kids at home. So he's got a, a boy and a girl, age seven, and he decided to wait about eight years to have his next child. So he's got a little baby on the way. So the fact that he's here right now is pretty amazing. So thank you. Glad to be here. <laughs> All right. So our, our next panelist is the president of Goldfish Swim School. This is Andrew McQuiston. Did I butcher that name, McQuiston, you know? Perfect. Yeah, Perfect. fantastic. Uh, and he's from the, the Birmingham, Michigan area, which on the mitten is your knuckle of your thumb. If you're any other Michiganers here, they always show their hand and tell you where they live. So yeah, you're up, Andrew. Great, thanks. Um, so the story of Goldfish started in 2006, and my brother and sister-in-law started the business. And essentially, it was a uh, my sister-in-law swam collegially, and she, uh, she saw a need for some lessons as she moved back to Michigan upon graduating from Arizona, and had just wait lists for um, you know, all summer long at you know, $50 an hour kind of thing. And so my brother and sister-in-law decided to quit their day jobs and, and invest in what they thought could be a, you know, a two to four school market in the Metro Detroit area, and borrow money from our parents, the, the typical story. And so they started their first school in Birmingham, and I was living in Southern California at the time, and they grew the business um, for two years and spent you know every single waking hour in the pool managing people, answering the phones, trying to run you know charge credit cards, and uh, and then so they spent those two years really refining what they thought the business was at just one school and one uh, location in, in Birmingham, and so time went on and every single person that walked through the door that was business minded asked if it was a franchise. Um, you know, how could people invest in that? How could they help them grow? 
And so they decided that uh, the one person that was really serious about it, uh, they said, you know, we'll become legal franchise if you become our first franchisee. Uh, when that person agreed to be a franchisee of the system, I got the phone call uh, when I was out living in Newport Beach. And uh, they said, hey, we're gonna start a franchise business, we wanna come back and partner with us. And I said, Detroit? I don't know. Um, so anyway, family's back there, that's where I grew up, so it was a pretty easy decision. Um, I literally quit my job in um, 48 hours and moved back in four weeks and moved in my parents and then started working out of my brother's basement. So the, the typical story that a lot of you in this room may be uh, a part of right now or have gone through, but um, really exciting. Today we sit here, we've got 120 franchisees in 35 states. Uh, we have um, about almost $200 million in system-wide sales and we have about 140 locations sold for future development. So we're really excited uh, and excited to share some good stuff with you guys today. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, and last but not least, Mark Carterick, and Mark has several titles, so I'm gonna try to get a couple of them off the board, but he's, he's acting CEO of Salon Ultimate. Ultima? Am I butchering that? Ultimate. Ultimate. Well, one of the programs says Salon Intimate, which I'd rather be. But, the, but also president of Nikita Salons, and, and I remember on the opening session, somebody had some questions and they were in the salon space, and I wanted to mention the fact that if you're here right now, Mark is the guy to ask, he, from Regis to Sport Clips to Roosters, thanks for this haircut, Roosters, a little plug there. Um, but yeah, he knows all things really salon space. So Mark, can you tell us how you got going and where you're at? Thanks, Doug. First, I wanna, this is late in the day, I wanna acknowledge all of you for showing up. Um, I had a good mentor who said, the, the world is run by the 20% of the people who show up. So I can see you're all here. And these guys are, are really sharp, sharp guys. My, I got in, I, a little different. I, 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 didn't, I didn't found a franchise. I went to business school, ended up at Regis, and many of you grew up in towns that had one in the mall. There used to be these things called malls, and um, <laughs> we had a very sophisticated real estate strategy called Next to Pennies, so that cost a lot of money. Um, but we grew, we had uh, about 300 stores, grew it to um, 12,000 in the 27 years I was there. But about halfway through, um, our strategy changed to acquisition. And I was uh, basically the COO of the Regis salons and the malls that you all went to, and we fried all your hair. Um, <laughs> that's why perms are out, by the way, but I'll tell you some more secrets as we go. Um, I found myself in franchising overnight. I was just turning 40, and we bought Supercuts. And uh, the CEO of the company said either he or I had to go to California to run it, and he wasn't going. So I ended up on California Street with Supercuts, and I had a thousand franchise stores overnight, and had to figure this franchising thing out. And uh, this community, who you are all interacting with, was very kind to me, uh, took me in, helped me. A lot of the people you've heard about and know about um, were, were very open and helpful. So I'm back here to hopefully be able to at least give you a few nuggets. I do suffer from what I call ADO, which is attention deficit opportunity, because I think it can be an opportunity, but you have to be careful to keep track of where I'm going, which is trying to tell you how I ended up here. So um, after Regis, um, our, our strategy, by the way, franchise, I learned something about businesses, really successful businesses, figure something out, that people don't quite get, and then they repeat it really fast before people catch up with them. Whether you're Sam Walton, whether you're Ray Kroc with McDonald's. So that's part of the secret, and it's interesting how that matches up with franchising so well. And so it's, I think that's kind of interesting, so that's what you should be thinking about, is how do I get an advantage and be able to repeat something really rapidly and really quickly. Also, be aware that what happened is, after the crash in 09, um, our business model of acquisition kind of fell apart. So if you look at Regis, it grew rapidly, and then around 08, 09, we had some partners come in. I laughed, because I saw that it wasn't gonna keep working. And so I had like 5,000 franchise stores. We had gone on to buy uh, Smart Styles and Walmart, First Choice Hair Cutters, Bo Ricks, Cost Cutters, on and on, and they would come into my group, the franchise division. And uh, when that ended, um, I went from 5,000 stores one day and then I had two because I became a franchisee. So I haven't been a founder like all of you, but I was a franchisee for a couple of years until John Francis, Johnny Francis, you guys know him? I don't know if he's here today. 
But he called me and he's on the board of Spore Clips and said, come down to Austin, Texas and help uh, Edward, who is Gordon Logan's uh, son, get ready to run the company. So I got to spend four years in Austin running Spore Clips with uh, Gordon and Edward, who are brilliant. Uh, and um, I'll talk more about that later. But uh, now, then I ended up hanging out in Austin. I liked it so much that I went to work with the software company that is uh, in Sport Clips and many other salons. It's appointment based, it's called Booked by Salon Ultimate. And while I was doing that, a woman who has 150 salons in Norway said, can we come and run them here? So I'm back in franchising. Norwegian salons called Nikita coming here to the US soon. And um, that's why I'm back on the panel. Thanks, Mark, that's awesome. Um, I think you really didn't really quite come out and say this, but in the beginning you were talking a little bit about uh, this community and how unique it is in franchising, how everybody is, it's, it's a lot like a family. And what I learned early on was that even if somebody is your direct competitor, being friends with that person can be very beneficial to each and every one of you. And that's something that has really served me well in this space. Um, even though you're gonna be selling into the similar groups, you're gonna learn a lot because they may have already gone through some of these steps. And people in franchising are really happy to share their expertise. And that happens from going to all of these events for sure. That's how I met all of these guys, but how I also met many of you. So even if they're your competitor, be nice, play nice, be respectful, and I think you'll find out that there's a lot of lessons that can be taught. Um, with that being said, we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the tools that are gonna empower your franchisees to be all-star performers. Um, and I think everybody in this room has probably already gone down the road of purchasing some tools that was maybe a bad idea, I'm guessing. Um, I run a software company, and we have over 100 clients they're a lot like me having, you know, franchisee locations. The amount of mistakes that we made in the first five years of doing business was astronomical. Uh, I can't tell you how much I paid for Salesforce when I had five people. It was a terrible decision by me. Now, I learned some better tools and more affordable tools to, to use and leverage, and we were able to grow learning Zen and build it into kind of what it is today as we continue to grow, but there were a lot of mistakes and you guys are gonna make them, but you gotta just keep making them. Don't be afraid to get back up and just take another shot at it because they're gonna talk about some stories about mistakes that they made along the way as well. But hopefully you'll get some really cool tools that you know what to start off with because there's hundreds. We know whether you're gonna get into a, a franchise management system or a royalty-based system or a learning management system or a CRM. Um, there's literally thousands of tools, so hopefully this group can help shed a light on some of the ones that have been really helpful for them. So, you know, just kind of thinking about where all of you are at today versus where you were at when you were starting. Josh, if you want to kind of just start off with, you know, when you started off, you likely had a bunch of tools that you were using, and it's probably evolved quite a bit. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, and so... I'm going to answer this one a little bit differently than I think it was designed, but we <laughs> talked about that. Yeah. Um, and I do not mean to call people tools, um, <laughs> but I will say that I think the biggest, you know, one of the biggest inflection points for us and changes was when we brought on people with franchise experience into our company. And I kept hearing this a lot as I was starting to franchise, how different, you know, my business is as it was and junk removal versus franchising. Um, but it became apparent really quick, and I think, you know, our ability to support our franchisees and our ability to get better at it is what's really helped us. And when I tried to just grow it with some people we already had on the team who really understood junk removal and not the psychology of supporting a franchisee and everything that goes into making sure they have a strong start and, and they're supported along the way, um, made a huge difference. And so I can tell you that. When I didn't have people like that on my team, we made a ton of mistakes. People were constantly angry at us. Uh, we're not as profitable and um, we were plateauing. And then when we um, added some really key figures, like for us, marketing, right? This is really, really important. We need to be a strong marketing company. We had a junior marketing person, one junior marketing person in charge of all the marketing for our company. I think he also liked to drink during the day, so that didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> but that could have been because of me, I don't know. <laughs> um, but, you know, invested in a really strong CMO early on, and man, the results that we've seen since then have been huge. 
Um, the other, you know, another people thing that I'll recommend is business coaches in general. And that was another area where we waited and waited and waited to get a business coach. Um, but man, we get our money's worth really fast from that. I think the, the faster you can get your franchisees to scale, to make money, to get, you know, to really get profitable, the better off the whole, your whole franchise company is gonna be. And again, that comes back to the psychology of a franchisee as much as it does the systems of the company. So uh, people and experience in franchising is what I'd say to start. Yeah, and the coaching one is one that I hadn't even thought about when we initially discussed tools, but if you can find the right coach and get in with them, and sometimes it's a little bit of trial and error with a lot of these businesses. It's a little bit like finding a therapist. You try, you go, you don't make any headway, pick another one and just move on and try them and see if it moves out, works out for you. Uh, Andrew, same question. I mean, what, how about tools and technology more of like along the uh, technology standpoint? What are you guys, you know, using today that maybe you didn't start off with that changed, you know, really helped you grow your business? Yeah, sounds good. So um, I think first and foremost, when we started our business, we had no money to invest in technology. So our technology was literally a three-ring binder and we would get what we called pre-registrations for some lessons and members would fill out a little form online, which was their name and phone number and when to contact them. We would print it off, put it in the binder, and then we'd call them back. And then if we didn't get a hold of them, we'd put a check mark. If we got a hold of them, they said don't call me, we'd cross them out. And if we booked them in, we'd circle it. So it's okay to not have money to invest in technology to start because we didn't. And it was getting back to the people side of things. It was just like the blood, sweat, and tears of starting a business. So, so that's the first part. Um, and, and then the second part is we leverage our franchisee. So at one point in time, our franchisee that had you know four locations said this is absolutely asinine that we're using a binder system and we have 20 or 30 locations at this point in time in the system. So they, you know, we didn't want to invest in the technology, but they said, we're just going to go get Salesforce and we're going to do, we're going to do it. And you know, that's what we're doing. We said, okay, we'll be in it with you guys. So after several franchisees started using Salesforce to, you know, monitor their lead flow and follow up, we said, okay, it's about time we step in. So we stepped in, we took over the Salesforce relationship from a global perspective. Um, and so that's just on the lead management side of things. But in terms of technology in general, we have changed over a handful of times from using Dropbox for, you know, where we keep storage files. Now we're a Google company. We also use Salesforce uh, for file storage. We use Opinion for training. So there's a lot of different things that we use and it's okay that things change. I would recommend not changing them often because franchisees will get frustrated with that because it's really hard to train a system as you continue to keep scaling and growing. You know, as we're at 120 schools now, it's just hard for my team to train 120 schools worth of people out there on how to use the new systems that we're putting out there. Um, but I'll say the one thing that has been the biggest learning uh, benefit for us in terms of talking about training and adding value to the franchisees world has been now that we have, have 120 schools in the system, we can collect all the data. So now we're getting data from uh, Scorpion, we're getting data from our POS system, we're getting data from uh, Salesforce and the lead flow, and we can actually take all that data and when our FBCs or franchise business coaches are having a conversation with a single unit, we can talk about attrition rate and how many students they're losing on a given time frame. And if they're losing 30% of their students in a month over month basis and the average across system is 22%, we can use that as a, te a teaching moment where we can speak to it and we can use data instead of our gut. We build our business off gut, which everybody in this room probably has done, um, but the real value is using the data across the system. And it's not just that, you, you know, pick the, pick the you know, four to eight key metrics that make your franchise locations thrive and, and go and what you can make change from that. If we're gonna talk about a number, I wanna make sure that I can do something with it. Any number that we talk about and we never do anything with it is kind of a waste of time. So make sure that you're investing the time and the money and the resources in meaningful numbers that make sense for franchisees. And I would engage your franchisees on what numbers that they care about. Um, because a lot of times what you think is important as a franchisor, they could uh, really care less about. And so it's really important to be in the relationship with your franchisees as far as that goes. Um, and so, you know, those are the biggest things. Salesforce is crazy expensive. Um, there was a portion of Salesforce that we used and we spent $300,000 and didn't actually use the product. Um, so there's learning, learning opportunities there for, for us, even as a larger franchisor. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions as it pertains to that as we get in the round tables, but there's a lot, of, a lot in there, a lot in that. 
when you guys are heavily technology driven, I mean, you can walk around with a dashboard on your phone right now and tell us what percentage of your franchisees are making money right now, right? Yeah, so, so every single day, and this really happened through COVID, we used to look at our enrollment numbers on a monthly basis because we're a monthly billing company. And then through COVID, when all of our franchises were, you know, in theory at risk, all of our locations closed for, you know, four to five months. And when, in the only way that we make money as a franchisor is when we have kids in the pool at our franchise location. So for, for four to five months, we made no money and our franchisees made no money. So that was when everything was very unstable for us, very scary. And with our CFO and our, our tech team, uh, you know, the, the charge for them was, I want to see numbers on a daily basis so we can see the trends and when schools are coming back and what that looks like. And then we built a dashboard out that can, you know, we ask every one of our franchisees, how many students do you need so that you are making money on a monthly basis? So now every morning I get a report that shares with me what percent of our, of our franchisees are actually making money. I can see how many students are booked into classes today, seven days from now and then 30 days from now. Uh, we can look at the top 10 and bottom 10 performers and on an enrollment side of things, on a financial side of things, so that we can then use those tools to um, impact and influence the conversations that we're having with our franchisees. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, Mark, you work for now a Norwegian-based company, and obviously you've had a lot of expertise in the USA space, the domestic space, and you've even built out technology, but how is it different just out of curiosity working for a, a country, you know, for a company outside of the state? Um, just mostly the language. Okay. Um, and what's funny is, you know, you have to pay a lot of money to translate um, software into another language. Yeah. Uh, although there's translators now, but what we're talking about right now, being able to take the book to buy to Norway and Sweden, and that's like one of the number one issues. Uh, and then the other thing you have is, um, complications of things like uh, credit card processing and sales tax and there's VAT and those kind of changes in the technology world that uh, most of us don't think about uh, when we're uh, building our systems. But if you, today, if I can leave you with a couple of things, but one is um, I, I think everybody got in the last year or so how important technology is. I think all of you too are seeing like unbelievable valuations and um, we heard we heard interesting and I'll, I'll throw it out as a, as a thought for all of you um, the reason I believe that franchising is is getting so much attention and has been for the last 10 or 15 years is it looks a lot like software and when you think about I, like I didn't get it how can these companies be worth four or five hundred million dollars and not make any money and now I work for a company, booked by, where we operated not to make any money because we continue to invest in growth and technology and, and, and product, okay? So what's a, what about it? And I looked at it and I went, you know, um, the valuations are, are similar to software because here's what you have. You want something that's a subscription. You want something that people sign up and have forever. And I know you don't maybe think about this way, but like everyone now has a phone. These are, what, $1,000 to buy now, the 12s? But that's not the deal. That's not why this is valuable, this computer. This is valuable because you're gonna pay $100 a month for the rest of your life. And the cool thing, and you heard it earlier with the finance guys, is they said franchising looks a lot like technology in that same space. Although in, in franchising, if you build your model not to make any money, you won't last that long. <laughs> But the idea about technology driving and how important it is and what your clients expect and what your franchisees are gonna expect is gonna be tech driven. Your franchisees and your clients expect your app to be as good as or similar to Starbucks or they don't care that you're small. So you're gonna to have to find creative ways to bring tech into your world and you can do it, you can find it, you can go look and find where there's uh, basically off-the-shelf apps that you can wrap around. You can find all that stuff, but I'm gonna tell you, if you're running companies today and you're not looking at the technology side of driving your business, you are going to be in trouble. And so I encourage you all to continue to look at that space and what you heard Andrew talking about. I, I use a little term like data. Make sure that your data translates into information. Data, raw data doesn't do any good. But it, you gotta make it information, and, and, and Andrew touched on it with your franchisees, they want information that's actionable and usable to them. 
and, and the technology is your tools, how you bring it in. And our book by software and many softwares now, the expectation is they can see activity in real time in their stores. So you can take the software that runs your point of sale and you can basically go into your location and see it run on a daily basis. So I think that's, there's a new bar and uh, I just wanna end with, to think about, um, a technology cost per client. Start to look at that, because I grew up in the era when all this stuff was free, right? I thought email was gonna be free, okay? Uh, texts are kind of free. But when you really dig in and find out, uh, AWS is a $13 billion storage business, and guess who gets to pay for all the AWS storage? We do. Uh, when you send texts, I, does anybody know what a text costs? It's great, because they won't tell anybody. Oh. You can be charged 10 cents a tax or whatever. So they cost 8 tenths of 1 cent. Now, if you don't, now, I know none of you care. Glaze it over, you want to go have a beer, I do too. But here's why it matters. <laughs> You're going to get a bill from somebody that's going to come to you and say, we can send your text for 5 cents. That's a 96% markup. So you need to be aware of where are those opportunities, because those costs are being added on to your franchisees or onto you. So as a leader, as a, you're gonna to have to deal with it, and technology is not going away. It's driving the world, and, and that's why, again, you see valuations for the technology companies just going off the charts, and that's really driving a, a heck of a lot of the, the good news for us in franchising is we're right behind, because we get people to sign up, build a swimming pool, and they're gonna be a client sending us money for 30 years, hopefully, 40 years. And the PE guys love that because they can build that financial model and that's what you guys eventually can monetize. That was awesome. So I know we have clients at Learning Zen that are in the same boat as many of you. And what happens sometimes is somebody will come along and uh, they're starting a new concept out and they have zero units today, but they really think they're gonna sign a bunch of units. So they really wanna invest heavily in their training program because eventually they can't be in all places at all times. And that's, that's the challenge. And with franchising, we're trying to duplicate our efforts. Um, but when you are looking to get into technology early on and you don't have a lot of units, you really need to be careful where you spend your money and where you put your money. I wouldn't recommend any of you come try to buy Learning Zen right now. If you don't have any units to sell and that you need to train, I would love to talk to you, but let's talk down the road. Save your money and to invest that back into your product right now where you can grow your systems that are gonna help you right off the bat. Um, and I, I know we went through this stretch you know, 18 months ago, and gosh, it's almost two years ago now when COVID started, but it was, it was kind of crazy. We were like, well, we've got this perfect platform. It's gonna be able to support distance learning and everyone is going to want it. And we're gonna, we're gonna go, our sales are gonna go through the roof. We didn't sell a single thing for six months. Nothing, like no one would pick up their phone call at all. Even though everybody needed a learning management system so they could reach their dispersed groups, it was crazy to think that no one would even pick up a phone call. And so we learned a lot of things, I think, during that stretch about how we could actually better support our existing clients and not focus on selling things. But the takeaways that we had from that were instrumental in how we've decided to grow Learning Zen moving forward. And I think you guys went through some interesting challenges during that COVID time where tools switch, like you, know, you probably switched to Zoom or Slack or things like that. And, and you heard stories where franchisors were talking to franchisees every single day and they were meeting in the morning and they would do a Zoom and then at night they would go home and they would get all the information back from the franchisees and try to figure out, well, how do we help them right now? And so they were leveraging technology that they had never even thought about using before. And Zoom became a, a verb, right? Where every, I'm gonna go Zooming. Um, and everybody is using that type of thing now. But what tools did you guys pick up from the pandemic that really helped? Any one of you can answer. It doesn't have to just start with Josh. Zoom. Zoom, yeah. <laughs> Slack, Zoom. Uh, so we use Google Hangouts internally and then with our franchisees for just general like getting on the phone and talking and I will say one thing that changed for us is before the pandemic I was the guy that always had my camera off um, and I would pick up the phone and call somebody now it's weird to me if my franchisee will not show their face on on the camera so that's one thing for us that's really changed and we have um, I think just 
it, there was a panel earlier today just about franchisee relations and communication, and I can't stress enough how important communication is. So we have not an FAC, but a BAC, which is Brand Advisory Council. Every Thursday, with our whole entire franchise system, we've done this for the last 12 years. We have a, it's called our Thursday call at two o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time, and we have about 400 people on the phone, all of our owners and our managers, and we literally talk about what's happening in the next seven days. And we, my whole entire franchise team is on the call. We're all, you know, on uh, on screen, and we do that through Zoom because we record those to send those out. You can't, we don't have the expensive version of Google to record them. So, um, but so we were on camera all the time now with franchisees. Uh, we modified our support structure where we're having monthly calls with our franchise business consultants and our marketing consultants and our curriculum coaches and consultants. And so they're on the phone on uh, Google Hangout every single month with our franchise owner and our franchise managers at all the locations. And using those metrics that we talked about and talking about how we can improve their NPS scores, because we believe that NPS scores and like those stay are a direct result of the swim lesson quality. So that's why we have curriculum involved in that. Um, we're talking about attrition rates and sales closure rates with our franchise business coaches. And then we talk about all of our Scorpio numbers with our marketing folks. And so those, those calls, um, although it sound like, yeah, okay, I get it, that sounds simple. Those have been really meaningful for us coming out of the pandemic as well, because we did not have some of those tools and techniques prior to the pandemic. And we've really kind of gone all in on what that, that means and what has meant for our franchisees and for us coming out of the pandemic. So Zoom, uh, we don't do a lot of Slack, but texting, I mean, tell any one of my owners or managers if you need me for whatever reason, you know, go through the right channels, but if you need to get to me, call or text. And we, every Thursday after these calls that we have with the whole system, we literally put all 50 of my employees' emails and cell phone numbers on the screen and they can call anyone, any one of us at any time. I know you've stepped away uh, from emails and really prefer texting. Is that something that you think will continue down in the future as well? We, we talked about, we, yeah. we met earlier and we're just saying the fact that if you send me a long email, the chances are I'm not gonna read it. I'm gonna probably save that and read it later and then never read it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so texting is a great way to get in touch with me, but I think that that's changed as well because we think we need to have that instant gratification of, hey, somebody saw that and they can reply right away and they don't have to read the introduction part of it. Um, Mark, you talk about Slack and some other tools. What else are you guys using that's new? Well, um, I'm using the subject line on email. Yeah, I, powerful. I, I, um, I, I, I'm going with, I, I, you get an email and you're gonna read it later, no. I, I, if I want to send an email to someone, I just put in a subject line what I want to tell them, and then there's nothing in the body of the email. And then it takes like three emails to get what they're going to read because they can see it. Um, I, I, you know, I, I kind of go with, uh, I want to go off of what Andrew said. I think what's changed in the last 18 months is the speed of conversation, whatever you're going to call it. I think we've all had to increase the rate of communication, whatever it is. And the paradox of the more ways to communicate, the more complicated it has become, I think, is something we have to grapple with. Um, we were, again, joking this morning. It's like, if somebody wants me to see something, I have 131,000 unread emails I'm very proud of. And, um, that's, that's true. That's true. Yeah. I, uh, I uh, just want, I, have, I say, hey, text me and tell me what you want me to do. And so if they sent me an email or whatever, then that's how I manage that communication. But the real issue, I think Andrew touched on it, you heard him. I have 400 people talking every week. We have on the um, uh, fixed calls, it's kind of old school, but... We have the, the software company, we talk with the leadership every day at four o'clock. And, and that's really been, an, I think, a result of what we've been through, because we're not meeting in the office, we're not meeting in the hallway, we just had to force communication and whatever, whether you use Zoom or whatever. I would just say, too, be careful not to pick too many methods, because someone will start to talk in Slack, and then they will send you something in, uh, in an email, and then you'll be in six different channels on Teams. We have Teams, I forgot about. That was one that we started yep. using. And Teams is great unless you're with three people here and two people here, and it just turns into a nightmare. So be careful. Yeah, I think everybody's attention spans have gotten smaller. If it's possible, they even got smaller over the last 18 months. I know we used to, in the training space, recommend you know courses that didn't exceed 30 minutes, and then that went down to 15 minutes. And now, I think if you're creating courses over five minutes, you're probably losing people's attention. Um, when you can learn how to cook a five-course meal on a 60-second TikTok, I think that's the attention span that we have to deal with, and we need to really take advantage of those small bursts of training information that we can push out to them and they can absorb it really quickly. Um, 
So we're going to break into breakout rooms in just a second. Sorry, breakout tables in just a second. But any questions for any of the panelists that are up here just about technology you're, you're wondering about or thinking about or getting started with or questions from the audience before we break into? Uh, OK, it's not about technology specifically, but I feel like I should know this term. A yeah, so yeah, we used to call them operations consultants. It's just, you know, quite frankly, it's our relationship between our franchise home office and then the franchisee's general manager. And so the FBC is now, um, we hired a new uh, VP of operations, and we've really leaned into not just a box checker. So prior to COVID, uh, we surveyed our ownership group and they felt like our operations consultants were literally people that we would have travel out to our schools four times a year and run through a checklist and they would get dinged if they didn't have Band-Aids in the CentOS box. And it was like totally ridiculous. So once we started having these conversations, we decided we're gonna have way more meaningful visits. We actually have less visits physically to the schools per year, but we have more meaningful conversations about actionable items that they can work on at their school. And so we're talking with them about things like attrition rates, we're talking with them about the close rates at the front desk. We can see now through a point of sale system who is a better salesperson versus the other, not in a way that we're you know, asking them to, to hire or fire or review or reward or recognize those staff members, but just awareness items for them. Um, and so that's one of those things that we've really leaned into and we're trying to elevate the support that we give to the franchisees with those coaches. Yep. And I'll, yeah. I'll just add to it. I mean, um, definitely all of those things, we're looking at KPIs where maybe they're off on standards, benchmarks. We look at average job size, number of jobs. We benchmark everybody against the system. We put the information out there so you know if you're winning or losing. Um, but also, I just want to hit on, we talked about psychology, and I think that mindset is everything. And with a franchisee, if they're they can be the best operator in the world, but if they're coming in and they have a chip on their shoulder or you know, they're just angry or they're not in a good place personally and we don't address that, then it doesn't matter how good of an operator they could be because they're not going to be. So I, I think it's just as much about the psychology of it, uh, often with new franchisees who are kind of experiencing these emotions for the first time. Yeah, question right there. We have a 2% brand fund, which we took advantage of really quickly. Um, so we were able to start building it up, building a surplus. We're going to do national TV this year because of it. Um, so we have that. Then we have separate marketing requirements specifically for the franchisee, which we track. We encourage them to spend a lot more than it <laughs> um, because it benefits them. Uh, so a little bit of both. And we also control and do most of the advertising on their behalf, which they prefer. Yeah, we have a 2% brand fund, and then there's a requirement that our franchisees spend 2% in their local market as well. Um, and we also have our, a royalty fee and then a technology fee as well. But I would, if you don't have a marketing fund and you're young and you can start it, I would highly recommend it now, opposed to waiting. Um, it's a very, very powerful tool. And when you put those things in your documents, it's easy to put them as zero and then say that you have the right to add them up to another percentage because as these guys are saying, if it's there and you're, you're in a sales function and you say, we have the right to do a technology fee, but we're not doing one right now, most people go, okay, okay get it. And when you come back next year and say we need 1%, you don't have quite the same level of resistance as you would have if you come in and say, hey, we got an idea for a new fee. That doesn't go over so good. That's true. This is Morgan. Uh, I'm sure we all have our KPIs for various industries and various franchises. Um, but any thoughts or uh, ideas, advice, or off-the-shelf tools for general uh, for setting franchisees up for general business success? How to read a PL, balance sheet, those things to get them off the right start, um, either from you know off-the-shelf learning management system or, or something, and then you can customize it from there. Uh, we do a combination of uh, learning management stuff that's off the shelf. They have to 
take it and we see if they complete it or not through a, an incredible program like Learning Zen, um, which it is. Uh, but we also complement it with coaching and training. We have uh, weekly webinars on different topics as well. So um, it's not just a one size fits all. We like to you know, really hit on important subjects multiple times in different ways. Yeah, we've worked with um, actually a vendor of the IFA, and I'm forgetting her name right now, but the company is called Profit Soup. And so um, she actually trains our FBCs at the part of the elevating our franchise business coaches this year was getting them some financial training so that when they're having a conversation with an owner and a GM, they don't sound like they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Um, and so that's one thing that we've done in terms of training internally, but also we've used uh, that group to help put together some training for our franchisees and their franchisees managers that we can use in a convention so that we can have you know, same page conversations where we're not on two different planets, we're in the same ballpark. And so that's been a, a meaningful tool for us. But um, you know, the one thing that we talk about with our franchisees, no joke, every single week on our Thursday calls at two o'clock Eastern Standard Time is safety, growth, and profitability. And our VP of uh, franchising is on that call and he says those three words every single time. And I, I can't stress enough too on the repetitive nature of what our role is as a franchisor is you know you have to say it seven times here the first time in terms of marketing well we say it like a thousand times because we really want that to sink in for our franchisees so we always talk about safety growth and profitability and like 10 percent of my franchisees are like okay can the guy shut up already and the other you know 90 percent are like wow you know 20 weeks down the road that's amazing that's a great concept i'm like yeah great i'm not glad you hear it now <laughs> i was I had, a, I had a mentor that told me when you're a CEO, you'll be surprised at how much you have to repeat yourself. All right, I think that wraps up the panel portion of this. We're gonna break into round tables. So I think it'll be important if we can, I know everybody's enjoying all the distance and space right now, but we're gonna have to maybe get, I think we've got eight facilitators. We've got the four of us and then four other volunteers. Can you raise your hand if you're a volunteer for a round table right now? Thank you, thank you. Thank you. We've got at least seven round tables. Um, so we're just gonna break into those and we're gonna just talk about with our peers about the tools that we're using, the tools that are being successful, the tools that we're struggling with. Um, and if anybody has any questions after, you'll be able to get all of the panelists' emails uh, as well as mine. So thank you all.